Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Hi, we're back again, and this time we're going to uh, discuss electric dipoles uh, and try to give you some insight, some physical insight into how these electric dipoles that individual molecules can possess. Uh, we're going to try to discuss how they influence certain physical properties uh, uh, that you can measure in a, in a lab. So it's important for you to understand the connection between these uh, these concepts that we write down and the actual physical manifestation of these concepts. And so that's basically what this, this lecture is all about. Um, so in the last lecture, we saw that uh, some molecules, uh, uh, even though they may be electrically neutral, can develop a dipole moments simply because different atoms attract electrons within the molecule in different ways. And this very subtle redistribution of charge within a molecule gives rise to a dipole moment. And what, and what we're going to discuss today is how these dipole moments of different molecules, how they can interact one with another and, uh, and produce effects that, that you can actually measure experimentally. So uh, to begin with, let's very quickly review uh, definition of a dipole moment. Again, this is a concept that you should have discussed in your introductory physics class. Uh, if you have, the basic idea is if you have two charges, a plus Q and a minus Q, they're separated by a distance D, then we say a dipole moment develops. This dipole moment in this set of lectures is given the symbol P. Uh, the dipole moment has a direction, so it's a vector, uh, and there's a vector sign over it. Uh, and the magnitude of this dipole moment is just the product of the charge that's been separated times the distance d over which the separation occurs. So the magnitude of the dipole moment p is just equal to the product of q times d. We need a system of units to measure dipole moments, and the system of units that's been developed historically is referred to as a, di as a Debye. Um, the Debye unit of, of uh, dipoles has its origins in old systems of units. I go through the details in this slide if you're really interested. Uh, but basically, one Debye, uh, a, a molecule that has a dipole moment of one Debye uh, basically means that there's about two tenths of electrons separated one from another by about a tenth of a nanometer. Uh, it turns out if you do that calculation, uh, you'll find out that one to buy is about 3.3 times 10 to the minus 30 coulomb meters, and that's the unit of dipole moment that we'll use uh, throughout the uh, set of lectures that, that will follow. Uh, dipoles, uh, electric dipoles are interesting uh, because they produce electric fields that are very non-uniform. I mean, that's the take-home message, I think. And I just sketch out the electric fields that are produced by, by dipole moment P, uh, as, as I've indicated in this particular slide. Again, things that you learned in your introductory physics class, uh, positive charges are sources of electric fields, so electric fields uh, diverge from a positive point charge. Uh, negative, uh, negative point charges or sinks up for electric fields, so electric fields uh, point toward a negative point charge. And if you calculate in detail the, uh, the, the way the electric field fills all space uh, when it's produced by a dipole, uh, it, the, the pattern that you get is indicated in this particular slide. And you can see that Depending on where you're at, the electric field points in different directions, and it also has different magnitudes. It has different strengths, depending on where you're located with respect to the dipole moment. And of course, this variability gives rise to all kinds of possible interactions between two dipoles that are located uh, in close proximity one to another. So that's something that we're going to develop in the course of this lecture. Uh, I think it's useful to just uh, remind you what the electrostatic potential energy of a permanent electric dipole in an external applied electric field E is, right? 
This is again a quantity that, that's of, of considerable interest and it basically means that if you take a molecule with a dipole moment and you place it in an external field, uh, the question is what electrostatic potential energy does that molecule acquire? And not surprisingly, the answer to that question depends on how the molecule is oriented with the external applied electric field. Um, I actually worked through the details of that calculation on this slide. It's just, uh, it's pretty straightforward. I won't go, won't, won't take the time to go through it. Um, but uh, you basically have to uh, take the uh, external electric field E and you have to split it into two components. You have to split it into a component that's perpendicular to the final angle of the dipole. That's called E perpendicular. It's indicated by the red arrow in this slide. And then there's also a second component of the external applied electric field that's uh, parallel to the dipole moment. That's referred to as E parallel, and it's the blue arrow in this particular slide. It turns out that the work required to twist the dipole from some initial position to some final position, that's only going to depend on the perpendicular component of the electric field. And you have to calculate the work in the, the work required to twist the dipole in the usual way. I work it out for the positive charge in detail. The negative charge gives you the exact same answer. And at the end of the day, you find out that the net electrostatic interaction potential energy of this dipole oriented at some angle theta with respect to an applied electric field is just the dot product of the dipole moment P into the electric field E with a negative sign associated with it. So it's a minus P dot E uh, potential energy. And this is, a, again, something that's useful to know. We'll come back and use it occasionally in the next set of lectures. Um, <clears throat> some textbooks define the initial angle of the dipole with respect to the electric field in a slightly different way. If you happen to, if you happen to have had a course in electrostatics in which the angle is referred to, let's say, as shown in this particular slide, uh, you'll get the same form of the electrostatic potential energy, but it may be offset by a constant, right? And that constant is just related to the definition of, of your initial condition. So, if, if that's a, a problem for anyone, you can, you can work through the arithmetic on this slide and you can see how the initial orientation of the dipole moment influences the form of the answer that you get. But it also, the, the calculation also reinforces the idea that constant offsets in the electrostatic potential energy are not, not particularly interesting. Uh, what we're really interested in is how the potential energy varies as a function of some parameter. In this case, it's the parameter, the twist angle of the molecule with, re with respect to the applied electric field. Uh, so it's a fair question, what physical effects are produced by interactions mediated by these dipolar molecules? And um, I, I just come up with two examples that, that I personally like and I use in lectures that I, I give around Purdue. Um, one, one idea is the fact that uh, if, you, if you, let's say, have molecules of water, they're indicated on the uh, uh, left side of this slide, right? And if you drop those molecules of water into a solution that contains ions, because water is a dipolar molecule, the negative ends of the water molecule will tend to orient closest to the, to the positive ions, sort of like I've got schematically sketched in the left-hand part of this slide. And that electrostatic interaction between this dipolar molecule and these ions is really rather strong. And uh, to illustrate that, I just always mention the fact that if you take like table salt, sodium chloride, and you try to melt sodium chloride in a lab, you're going to have to heat it up to about 800 degrees centigrade, which is a, a sizable temperature. It's not easily achieved. Um, uh, but that 800 degrees centigrade is some indication of how strongly the sodium and the chlorine atoms are bound one to another in, in, in common table salt. But everyone knows that if you just drop table salt into water, it dissolves immediately. 
right? And the, the reason sodium chloride dissolves is because these dipolar interactions between the dipole moments of the molecule and the sodium and chlorine atoms uh, of sodium chloride uh, basically tear the, the, the sodium chloride uh, uh, crystal apart, right? So these, these dipolar interactions can be really rather strong, and, um, and uh, they're responsible for whether uh, a solid A is uh, soluble in a, in a liquid B, right? It depends a lot on the dipole moment of the liquid that, that you're, uh, you're considering. Um, the other uh, physical manifestation of these uh, interactions between dipoles is if you have molecules that have permanent dipole moments, there could be dipole-dipole interactions between those molecules. And um, I indicate how that dipole-dipole interaction could go qualitatively in the right-hand corner of this slide. You can see that if the molecules with dipole moment P are free to move, they can orient one with respect to another. The orientation they assume is going to minimize their uh, electrostatic potential energy interaction. And I give a few possibilities uh, that, that uh, indicate how these dipole moments uh, could line up. The interesting thing is that the strength of these dipole-dipole interactions are going to determine things like the, uh, the boiling point of a liquid, right? The stronger the dipole-dipole interactions are, the higher the boiling point of the liquid's going to be. And I try to illustrate that, uh, that trend by just taking uh, maybe five or six different molecules. The molecules were chosen with increasing dipole moment, measured in units of the bi, right? And if you just plot the boiling temperature, the normal boiling temperature of these liquids is a function of their dipole moment, you can see that uh, the, there's a linear, uh, nearly linear increase in the, the, the boiling temperature uh, which indicates that those molecules with the highest dipole moment interact the strongest one with respect to another. Um, that's the situation with molecules that have permanent dipole moments. We'd like to consider the interaction forces between molecules that do not have a permanent dipole moment. So these forces are a little bit more subtle to think about. They're referred to generically as inductive forces because basically what happens is a molecule that has a dipole moment, when it encounters a molecule that does not have a dipole moment, the electric fields produced by the, uh, di the, the polar molecule spread out and fill all space. Those electric fields can induce a dipole moment in the second molecule. And uh, this induced dipole moment in the second molecule then can cause a, a, an interaction between the molecule with a permanent dipole moment and the molecule that uh, is, is uh, nonpolar. So uh, that's, uh, that type of interaction is indicated schematically in the left-hand part of this slide. And it, it gives rise to all kinds of interesting interactions uh, between uh, molecules that you would not normally think would interact one with respect to another. The situation is even more interesting if you have two molecules that are nonpolar. So there's no dipole moment in either molecule. Uh, the question becomes, can these molecules interact and uh, bond together to form, let's say, a liquid from the, from the vapor phase? And the answer is yes, they can. And uh, the reason is a little bit more subtle. Uh, because now what you have to do is you have to take into account the, the electron wave function, the electron cloud that surrounds uh, uh, and defines each molecule. And you have to look for uh, perturbations in that electron cloud. And for a short period of time, it's possible that more electrons populate one region of the molecule than another. And for that short period of time, then there's an instantaneous dipole moment that sets up, let's say, in molecule one. That instantaneous dipole moment that sets up in molecule one then induces a dipole moment in molecule two. And the induced dipole moment in molecule two then allows an interaction between molecule one and molecule two. So 
that situation is very qualitatively sketched out on the right hand part of this slide. And it basically requires a, a, a very careful correlation of the motion of electrons uh, in these, in these, uh, in these nonpolar uh, molecules. And again, we'll come back and we'll work out the equations and discuss that in more detail in, in, a, in a couple lectures from now. Um, but this, this, uh, this interaction between two uh, nonpolar molecules is very important. It gives rise to the London dispersion force. And this London dispersion force is typically the force that interacts between a tip and a substrate. And we'll go on to derive those, uh, those equations in, in, the, in the next few lectures. Um, there, are, there are many examples of nonpolar molecules that interact one with respect to another. Um, uh, turns out the interaction depends roughly on the size of the nonpolar molecule. And I, and I illustrate that in two ways uh, in, this, in this diagram in this slide here. Uh, in the upper part of this diagram, uh, the upper part of this slide, uh, I just look at the normal boiling temperature of nonpolar molecules, and I plot that, that boiling temperature as a function of the molecular mass of each molecule. In other words, how many grams per mole does it take for these uh, 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 nonpolar molecules? What, what's the, what's the uh, grams per mole for each of these nonpolar uh, molecules, right? I consider the case of uh, inert gas atoms, the, the argon, the krypton, the xenon, the radon, and then the nonpolar diatomic gas molecules uh, like nitrogen, oxygen, bromine, and iodine. And what you can clearly see is that the bigger the molecule becomes, the more electrons that are contained in the molecule, uh, the higher the boiling temperature uh, goes. So these, these dispersion forces between nonpolar molecules depends very sensitively on how big the molecule actually is. A uh, second example is indicated in the lower part of this slide. And here what I do is I just, just point out the fact that two identical, uh, uh, or, or two molecules with identical chemical formulas can have different boiling points depending on the orientation of the atoms within the molecule. So in this case, I'm, I'm looking at the situation for a neopentane and I'm comparing it to n-pentane. Both molecules have the same chemical formula, but it's known that the neopentane forms a molecular structure that is a little bit more compact than the n-pentane molecule, which tends to be more linear in nature. The net result is that the n-pentane, because it's, it's bigger in size, has a slightly higher boiling point than the uh, neopentane, and that's just strictly a function of the uh, London dispersion force that, that's operating between the two molecules. Um, I, I can't leave this topic without pointing out that uh, uh, the, the situation of hydrogen, especially when it's bonded to oxygen, um, uh, produces an anomaly, and, and what I do here is I just plot the boiling point uh, as a function of uh, hydrogen telluride, as a function of the row of, of, uh, in the periodic table that a particular element is located. So in particular, I consider the case of sulfur, selenium, and tellurium, and I plot the boiling point of these uh, these liquids is a function of their position in the row number. Um, and what you would expect if you consider the case of hydrogen bonded to oxygen, if you would follow this trend, uh, you can see that you would expect a, a, a boiling temperature down around minus 100 centigrade, but in fact uh, the boiling point for water everyone knows is about 100 degrees centigrade. So. For some reason, oxygen and, and uh, hydrogen, when bonded to one another, don't follow the chemical trend and, uh, that you might expect. And of course, this is referred to as, as the hydrogen bond, right? Uh, this hydrogen bonding has all kinds of consequences. And I just, again, I, I, I refer to the boiling point of different molecules. So in this case, I've, again, I, I've chosen two molecules with the exact same chemical formula. The location of the oxygen atom is different in the two molecules. 
Uh, because the location of the oxygen atom is different, the, the hydrogen bond between the hydrogen and the oxygens uh, between two molecules are different. And as a net result, the boiling point of these two molecules with the identical chemical formulas is vastly different. It's referred to as hydrogen bonding. And uh, I also have to point out that it's not just oxygen, it's nitrogen and fluorine that are also anomalous. Uh, the equivalent plot of boiling temperature versus molecular weight for these compounds are given. Uh, you can see that uh, in the case of carbon, uh, or you can see that in the case of the analogous molecules bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, the boiling points are anomalously high, and it just indicates that hydrogen bonded to nitrogen, hydrogen bonded to oxygen, hydrogen bonded to fluorine uh, uh, has the capability of producing these, uh, these anomalous hydrogen bonds. Um, so this is, this is the end of the lecture that discusses the physical manifestations that you might expect when two molecules that have dipole moments interact one with respect to another. Um, what we are going to do in the next set of lectures is we're going to try to uh, apply this very basic information to uh, finally start discussing the, the interaction between a tip and a substrate. So if we want to do that, we want to develop quantitative models, uh, we have to have some firm understanding of these dipoles and how the dipoles interact. And the intent is that this, these, uh, these first two lectures give you some uh, physical insight into that dipole-dipole interaction. It's going to be very important when we discuss the tip-substrate interactions in the, in the next few lectures. So thank you, and we'll see you... Uh, uh, we'll see you in lecture three where we'll continue on with this discussion.